What I really wanted to discuss today uh, was reading. And really, reading is an imaginative and a reflective act, which I think comic strips lend themselves to. And especially when you use comic strips as primary sources. Um, and I wanted to talk about comic strips, especially as a way for us to understand the past, to talk about reading, to talk about reading primary sources, and to talk about reading as an imaginative act, and also as a reflective act, an act that engages students and instructors in a consideration of their own assumptions and ideas. In terms of reading comic strips, I think one of the first questions that come up, not just simply as what is a comic strip for a means to understand the past, but is why comic strips? Now, I've been a librarian for about four or five years. I've been a historian for more than 20. And so this is my second incarnation. And I've taught uh, comic strips and diversity as part of a first year seminar for a number of years at the University of Minnesota. Something I don't do anymore, but I've done, and I think done pretty well in the past. And people have often said, why comic strips? I actually had a colleague once laugh aloud and say, huh, what's next, puppets? And the irony was that that very same year, the Modern Languages Association gave one of its highest awards to a book entitled The Secret Life of Puppets, <laughs> which was all about how the supernatural in a secular age had become sublimated into all the forms that we wouldn't expect, like golems and terminators and marionettes. So one of the things I particularly have in mind is a notion of basically playfulness, and that there is something really engaging about using primary sources that we associate with whimsy or drama or humor in contrast to what students and what sometimes instructors may assume has to be the nature of the primary source, something that's dull or dry or difficult to engage. And that is something that I think gives us an opportunity to play on that irony. Because in the end, I think comic strips are an extraordinary challenge. They're also a wonderful way to gain insight into the American experience. Uh, one of the things particularly to talk about for your purposes if you were to take comic strips into a classroom are some of the premises about comic strips and why comic strips. Particularly because I want to talk about comic strips not comic books. I distinguish between these things. Not graphic novels, which many of your students are familiar with. Not manga, a Japanese expression of the illustrated form. I want to talk particularly about comic strips and their features, their history, and the thing that gives comic strips an association in American culture unlike any of those other forms. And that has a lot to do, particularly, this distinction in their form with the size, the nature, and the diversity of the audience. The size of the American comic strip audience is simply enormous. From the time of the 1890s when they become almost synonymous with American newspapers, readership is vast. In the late years of the newspaper age, and I almost caught myself when I was putting this together, thinking that I was speaking about it in the past tense, in the late years of the newspaper age, the readerships are simply enormous. The prospective readership that's most often cited for the 1990s is something on the, on the order of 100 million people a day for comic strips, wildly different. That also gives us a profoundly different nature of an audience than the sort of niche audiences that you would see with comic books or graphic novels or manga. But you also have, as a function of that, an extraordinary diversity of that audience. That diversity is largely derived from a very modern process of syndication. Syndication is uh, one of the most extraordinary things in shaping comic strips, not only in the kind of expression that you see, but also in the way the comic strips are read and experienced. With respect to syndication, Comic strips become, because newspapers make comic strips available through syndicates or chains of newspapers, part of a, comic, a common experience. Newspapers are read, comic strips are read widely, and even though you may be reading a local newspaper, you are often reading a comic strip that other Americans are reading at that very same time, regardless of where they are, who they are, <laughs> 
And so many people begin to experience comic strips as a shared experience. They may not be familiar with many other facets of someone else's life, but they may have something in common simply because of that comic strip experience. There is an argument, I think, to be made that out of this, you begin to get an extraordinary sight into the American imagination. That is to say, because comic strips have to work for people, they have to be recognizable, understandable, you are beginning to get a window, however problematic this may be, and however slippery it may prove to be, that begins to give people an idea of their shared experiences and also things that are common to their experiences. That doesn't mean that they're going to share or agree, but we begin to get a sense of a time, a place different than in our own. I will make a challenging argument now, but I think you may agree that the most recognizable American in history is Snoopy. I actually honestly wonder if we could walk down a street in a major modern American city and perhaps dealing with someone over the age of 12, because perhaps Snoopy is slipping from us, much as little orphan Annie might have been the Snoopy of her day, and I would also add probably Franklin Delano Roosevelt's most significant opponent, a very archly political comic strip, that Snoopy may be the most recognizable American. I think we'd be hard pressed to find somebody who wouldn't recognize Snoopy. People might pause and say, oh, for goodness sakes, Wendell, surely Abraham Lincoln would be the most immediately recognizable American? I'm not entirely sure especially since you're looking at a picture right now that you might think is Lincoln, but it's actually Jefferson Davis. Oh, interesting. So with that as a prelude, I'd like to talk a little bit briefly about how you might explore the form of the comic strip first, and then give some consideration to how you might actually explore the text. I pause to give you the air quotes that seem to be required by many humanists. The text in several different senses. The way that you could actually read what's being presented on the page in a literal or more metaphorical sense. I think one of the most interesting things that I discovered over the course of time working with comic strips and working with first year college students is that exploring the form, the actual way that comic strips work as a visual art is actually the best way to prime the pump. It's a way to begin. Scott McCloud, himself a comic artist, has written one of the more extraordinary books about comics, which he subtitles The Invisible, the Ar the Invisible Art. In essence, what McCloud does is to make something that we take for granted and that is effectively invisible, visible. Those of you who are close enough have already started to laugh because you've read one of, many of McLeod's many jokes. In the first panel, in this panel you can't even see my legs, yet you assume that they're there, even though they're not. This begins to really work on students. They begin to see how, as McLeod has observed, comic strips can appeal to all of your senses. You may not realize it, but of course you can smell comic strips. All you have to do is put an image of a garbage can with flies circling around it, and you know what you're going to experience. Or as McLeod says at one point, as his character explains something to you, can you hear me? Did you understand what I just said? Because if you did, check your ears. Nobody is speaking. So in essence, what McLeod does, and I think works nicely in a classroom, is that he makes visible what is invisible. And that's the same sort of thing that exploring this form as a primer helps you do to make, what's, make explicit what is implicit in comic strips. All those sorts of things that are unexpected and surprising. This is, I think, the beginning of that experience of exploring a primary source that is at once an understanding of the information that it provides, but also the tension inside for the student and for the instructor. Just as exploring the form with McLeod becomes a way to understand how the psychology and experience of the reader is involved in making meaning from a few gestures from the artist, 
That very phrase, I promise you uttered, if you begin to explore comic strips removed in time for your students, is what continues that experience. A little bit of alienation and a little bit of tension is evident in that observation. That's not funny. The crucial thing is, as a historian and as a student of the past, that's not funny to you. But then the question is, why? Now, maybe you're dealing with a comic strip where the joke is just bad, or you're dealing with a form that's just not intended to be humorous. In many instances, students come to comic strips assuming that they're going to be part of what's sometimes called the laugh-a-day genre, that is supposed to be a joke. Well, of course, as we know, if you begin to reflect for a moment, there are all sorts of different forms that the comic strip has taken. Drama, soap opera, it has had all sorts of different ways to express a human experience. So why something isn't funny at any given moment is a really challenging question because what often you're dealing with is a sense of humor or a perspective or a set of ideas that are different than those of your students or your own. Or if that difference is not so vast, you can at least realize and recognize a distinction, a disparity. With that in mind, one of the more extraordinary things to do is to explore all sorts of themes with comic strips. I mean, one can really explore race, class, gender, and sexuality, and a host of other experiences in comic strips. I think there's a temptation sometimes to reach for the stereotype and its representation in comic strips. One of the most powerful things that I think a student ever observed in one of my classes looking at early American comic strips from the beginning of the 20th century was to say, you know, I honestly think the Irish, if we shaded them in, could be the same as the African Americans in these strips. Absolutely. In fact, historians have been exploring for about 30 years how the Irish became white, much to their fascination, the way that race and ethnicity has worked over time. And some of these things, I think, pop out at you almost immediately when you begin to see them for the first time. This is Mary Worth. Those of you who are familiar with Mary Worth, I ask you to imagine for a moment Mary Worth not as a woman of a certain age, but as a teenage boy. So how possibly could that teenage boy work as an observer and a giver of advice, welcome and often unwelcome? it would be a wholly different experience. It plays, it plays not only with expectation, but with understandings that we have. I have to say that earlier today, you were told that I'd be discussing all the sources, wonderful and amazing, available at the Denver Public Library. Friday and Saturday are my days off. <laughs> I am off my leash today. And so what I'd like to do is tell you, of course, about sources that would be available at the library. These are sources that you would use for newspapers to be able to explore comic strips. Obviously, digitized newspapers are one source of comic strips. And in fact, Chronicling America, the site that Jill showed earlier for the Library of Congress's digitized newspapers, uh, actually has a little sub-site that allows you to explore some comic strip uh, sources on all those digitized papers. One of the things, though, that you will discover is that when you start looking for comic strips in digitized papers, the keyword searches don't sometimes work quite as well. So you may find yourself browsing through newspapers, an experience not altogether unlike what you would have with microfilm. And I really do think that microfilm affords you a great way to get into not only comic strips, but to explore large spans of time. One of the things that we all know, people who've been involved with newspaper digitization, is that much of it is focused on the period before 1923, because that's the material that's in the public domain. No such limitation with respect to microfilm. Plenty of possibilities. But then what about approaches? I honestly think that some of the best approaches have been collaborative with groups of students who've been asked to explore a theme. What is a family? What is the experience of families broken apart? How does class work? How does race work? Ethnicity. How does race and ethnicity work when it's erased? Explore post-World War II comic strips, for example, and try to find people of color. 
present before and then absent. As one scholar has observed, this is part of a recasting of what constitutes America. Really rather fascinating in the post-World War II era. For the very best students, it's often a terrific way to get into a single comic strip, but that, I think, sometimes can present a tension. That tends to be a little more descriptive than analytical. And then getting students to read comic strips or share their readings of comic strips together tends to give you a sense of the slipperiness of some of these things, even as they have to, as I've said before, work for students. Those comic strips invite them to recognize that, the, that they, as readers, will sometimes disagree. I end, as I began, with my favorite, Crazy Cat. And I realize for some of you this may be a little bit removed. This is actually a Sunday strip. And it's a Sunday that finds Crazy alone. Crazy says, well, here I are, all alone, nobody around but myself. It's terrible. The newspaper flops from the airplane, and Crazy discovers, why? Goodness, there's me in this newspaper. Crazy's looking at comic strips. And likewise, Ignatz, gee whizzle. Ignatz the mouse approaches. Certainly, fool, why not? But Ignatz, darling, here I are here, and here you is here too. Of course, responds Ignatz. But if I are here and you is here, how come I are in the paper? You also answer me that. To which Ignatz replies, because fool, how could it be aught? Were it not thus, you answer me that. And to carry out their perennial struggle, Crazy looks closer and says, wooey, look here is also a brick. Give a look, Ignatz. As all my lives live, Ignatz, it's a brick. And bless my soft cerulean eye, says Ignatz, here is also a brick. And wh what do you thunk? What do you think? You are on the urge of tossing it upon my noodle. I am indeed. Whoo! Here comes Officer Pup, the third in this love triangle, by the way. Here comes Officer Pup. Yes, I hear he comes for a fact. Ooh, he's saying something at you. It seems to be something in utter roughishness and utter uncouthish language. And suddenly the paper's snatched away. Give me back my paper. Well, here I are, all alone with nobody around but myself. But here we all are, reading and understanding comic strips. <laughs>